Good afternoon. Welcome back. Our keynote speaker is going to come up. Chuck Flaish, Richard Peterson is Clinkett Kogwantan clan. Richard grew up in Kassan, Alaska, and is a lifelong Alaska Native resident of Southeast Alaska. Prior to being elected president of the Central Council of Clinkett and Haida Indian Tribes of Alaska, Central Council in other words, in 2014, Richard served as CEO of Prince of Wales Tribal Enterprise Consortium, LLC, Powtech, president of the organized village of Kassan, mayor and city council member for the city of Kassan, and member of the Southeast Island School District Board of Education. He also previously served as Clinkett and Haida delegate and executive council member. Chuck Leish has developed skills necessary to effectively represent and communicate the needs of our native people of the Southeast Alaska. He is adept at negotiation, negotiating and team building and has worked to continually build lasting relationships that prove to be mutual beneficiary for all stakeholders. Richard believes in being proactive approach to achieve win-win scenarios and continue to shape the future of the economic and social well-being of our tribal citizens through collaborative efforts and the local economic development initiatives. Please welcome to the stage President Peterson Chuck Laish. <laughs> Good afternoon. As Jenny said, my name is Sakya Ish. I'm Kaguantan from the Eagle's Nest House in Sitka, Haida uh, from by way of Haukan, but I grew up in the village of Kassan. Um, <clears throat> and yes, I'm president of Clinkett and Haida. It's an honor to be here today, and I want to thank the people of the Akwan for allowing us to be on their lands uh, nearby to the uh, traditional Juno Indian village right across the street. <clears throat> so Clinkett and Haida is the largest federally and state recognized tribe in Alaska with over 37,000 enrolled tribal citizens across the state of Alaska and the nation, and quite honestly, the world. <clears throat> we are a regional tribe representing Southeast Alaska. Uh, again, it's so very important for us to take that time to recognize the traditional lands that we're on. While we have federal state uh, recognition today, for Clinkett and Haida people, we're clan people. That's who we really truly are. Right? We introduce ourselves as Clinkett Haida, but my true self is Kaguantan. That's my clan. I'm from the Eagle's Nest House. And when you say that, you know as, as a Clinkett man, when I say that, I just told you who my mother is, who her mother wa was, who their mother was, going back for tens of thousands of years. And that's how long that we've occupied and, and lived in these lands and stewarded these lands. <clears throat> so I, I really do want to say uh, to those clans for hosting us, for allowing us to be here to conduct the business that we do truly as uh, clan people. <clears throat> it's an honor to stand before you today at this uh, Alaska Just Transition Summit, a gathering committed to shaping a future that honors our communities, protects our lands and waters, deepens sovereignty, fosters healing, and remembers forward. As we embark on this journey together, we are guided by four key themes. Building the communities we want. Our communities are the heart of our existence. They are the bearers of our culture, the guardians of our traditions, and the architects of our future. We must ensure that our communities are vibrant, resilient, and inclusive. This means investing in education, healthcare, infrastructure, and economic opportunities that empower all citizens to thrive. Number two, protecting our lands, bodies, 
of water and air. Our connection to the land runs through our DNA, intertwined with our identity, our spirituality, and our well-being. We are the stewards of these lands, these sacred spaces, entrusted with their care for generations and generations to come. We must safeguard them from exploitation, contamination, and destruction. We must uphold our responsibility to preserve the ecological balance and honor the inherent rights of nature. Number three is deepening sovereignty and democratic representation. True sovereignty begins with self-determination. It is the right to govern ourselves, to shape our destiny, and to protect our interests. We must assert our sovereignty in all aspects of our lives, reclaiming control over our economies, our resources, our lands, and our futures. We must also demand meaningful representation in decision-making processes, ensuring that our voices are heard and our concerns are addressed. One thing that I always remind people when there are other groups uh, convening, we're not stakeholders. Never refer to us as stakeholders because our commitment, our connection goes so much more deeper than a stakeholder. I've sat on commissions where we had to wait for the meeting to start so lawyers from California could fly in because they were the stakeholders. And they called us stakeholders. And I remember sitting there, it was the Tongass Futures Roundtable, and it was deciding the future of the Tongass. And at that time, there were only two people from the Tongass in that room, true people from the Tongass. And that was uh, the former Lieutenant Governor Byron Malat and myself at the time. Over 40 stakeholders in the room to make decisions on our forests and how they move forward, how they were gonna utilize our resources, how they were supposedly gonna protect our resources. Resources that we're tied to for tens of thousands of years, resources that we are born in charge to steward. We're not stakeholders. So do yourself and, and me a favor, if we're ever in a meeting, don't call me a stakeholder. <clears throat> Number four, healing from colonization, capitalism, and the patriarchy. The wounds inflicted by colonization, capitalism, and the patri patriarchy run deep. They have fractured our communities, exploited our land, and oppressed our people. But healing is possible. It begins with acknowledging the past, confronting injustice, and, fo and fostering reconciliation. It requires us to dismantle systems of oppressions and build new ones rooted in equity, justice, and compassion. The summit's theme, Remembering Forward, gives us our marching orders. In order to know where we are going, we must know where we've come from. I want you all to close your eyes and picture a time of abundance, an abundance of salmon, an abundance of berries, seaweed, deer, caribou, moose, all of the animals that we rely on, an abundance of indigenous language speakers, an abundance of culture bearers, an abundance of traditional knowledge that shows us how to live in balance with these things. That is how our ancestors lived. Now open your eyes and think about the times we've got to watch our babies learning to cut salmon for the first time, watching your nieces and nephews learning our songs and dance, hearing your elders speaking our language. There is hope, we have a path forward. We are our ancestors' wildest dreams. You hear that said often and it's true. We see it more and more every day. Our culture is permeating, our people are thriving again, our languages are seeing a resurgence. We're seeing that interest from our own people to learn our languages. Dr. Soboloff, the former Dr. Soboloff said often, when we know who we are, we don't hurt ourselves. That's that connection to our culture, our language, our, our sense of place. We have people in our communities that uplift us. We have cultural, we have tribal leaders in our villages who work every day to make sure that our young people have that access to our culture, to our language, to our way of life. And our culture isn't any one thing. It's not just the language, it's not just subsisting. I hate that word, by the way. It's a way of life. 
and we're rich. And I say often, we come from the most beautiful people in the world, who are the richest people in the world. You know, we didn't know hunger. We didn't know to what it meant to be unhoused. And we didn't know what it meant to be persecuted for living our true selves. Those are all things that came with the colonization, with the patriarchy. And it's up to us to break that. And we have that within us. We have the tools our ancestors have always given us. So <clears throat> again, we want to hold, uphold our, our culture bearers who are the true leaders in our communities. Some of us wear titles of presidents and council, but it's our aunties, our uncles, our nannies, our chinas, our grandparents. That's where we get our real leadership from. That's where we get the knowledge that we have to break these cycles, to begin not anew because we've always been, but what I say renewed. So <clears throat> a pet peeve of mine really is hearing people talk about our, our native people in the past tense. Even ourselves, we do this. We talk about ourselves in the past tense. As a tribal leader, I have people come up to me and say, what would your people do? What did your people do? And I say, I can tell you what we do now, because we didn't stop. I grew up in a village where we harvested and put up fish to this day. That hasn't stopped. I think the only thing different now is that we have to send so much off to our families who had to move away, who were re relocated, often not by choice often because they, of the programs that existed to dismantle our communities. And when they knew if they could dismantle our communities, they could dismantle our culture. That's why residential schools were created. That's why these relocation programs and education programs were created, not for opportunity. That was what they painted the picture of. You want to uh, <clears throat> get a good job, you have to go get an education. We have an education. It was passed down for 10,000 years. Some of the most intelligent people I know don't have a degree, but they live the way of our people and our way of life. <clears throat> and I say there is hope. And we stand on the shoulders of our giants, of our ancestors. Often in our culture, Clinket culture, we hear, we walk on the shoulders of giants because we knew our ancestors. We know what they did, that they thrived, that they had complex systems of law, of science, of there were engineers, there were doctors. They had different names than what Western society calls them, but we had all of that. And in fact, the reason Western culture was able to come and survive here is because of our knowledge, because we share so openly, and because we come from a thriving people that they were able to come in, and unfortunately, in most cases, co-opt and push us away. I know uh, in the coming days, I'll be here, we're having a land back discussion, right? And I often say, when people ask us about land back, well, what does that mean to you? What it means to me is getting our land back legally and lawfully that was illegally and unlawfully taken. If you look out, the, out past the parking lot, these two buildings under construction, the tribe has bought those. We're buying up all the property that was the old Indian village because that's what our Juno community asked us to do. And it makes people uncomfortable. And it's funny to me because those buildings were owned by an investment firm in California. But when the tribe bought them, the, the community got scared. What are they doing? What are they doing? Why do you care what we're doing more than you did outsiders? <clears throat> it, it's really incredulous to me that so many people are so concerned and offended by what we're doing when, again, we're legally and lawfully buying back what was illegally and unlawfully taken. And, and that's what we're doing. That's what land back means to me. Land back isn't just some social statement. It's a mission. It's, it's what we need to do for us to heal and to be whole again. You heard me open. Our connections are to these lands. I used to joke that I have roots in my feet 
and they go longer than the trees that we see around us because our people were here before those trees ever grew. Those trees have been here for hundreds of years. Our people have been here for thousands of years. Do I care about the trees? Do I care about the salmon? More than anything. But I also care about them in the way that I see us just as important and that we have to put everything in balance again. We've lost our sense of balance. You know, <clears throat> I've watched so many of our elders pass that at our tribal assembly, I get up and I look at a room like this, and we lost so many elders, I felt like I was losing the landmarks that were on the map of my life. I have felt lost because we've lost those elders. But I know that those elders believe in us. I know that our elders knew that we can do it, and we can. And again, we, it's again remembering forward. I love that theme. I asked my staff, what does that mean to you? What does that mean? I was trying to grasp it. And it really just fits us because it's truly, we have to know where we came from to know where we're going. For Clinkets and Haidas, that's our, that's our wayfinder, is to know where we're from. Wherever we live in this world, it still comes back to where are we from. I'm from Kisan. I'll live in Juneau for probably the rest of my days, but I'll always be from Kisan. I know that. I know that's my point of origin. I know it's what grounded me. I know it's what has helped build me into the person I am today. And I hope all of you have that point. I hope you all have that wayfinder that tells you where you're from. And many of you still live in your communities and your villages. And we want to do everything we can to partner together. And I think that's what this summit is about, is us coming together and sharing knowledge, finding and, and meeting people who have common interests of not being from an extractive economy, one that only sees things taken and never come back. But how can we have an economy that's based on us, for us, and by us? And I think that's the question that we have to talk about. How do, how do we build economies that mean that we're going to have healthy, healthy populations, healthy schools, housing? One of the biggest crises we have right now in Southeast, and I probably believe statewide, is housing, safe affordable housing, where our families can grow and thrive, not on top of each other, not in substandard, but our children shouldn't have to worry about whether they're going to have electricity or running water. They shouldn't worry about what they're going to have to eat. We should give them everything they need so that they can thrive, so that they can grow up in the excellence that they are. Uh, a language teacher, I, I went to a graduation of their immersion, and he said, we always have to remember that our children are born excellent. It's our job to nurture that, to continue to keep them in excellence, to remind them they're excellent, and make sure that the surroundings, their environment are excellent, so that they can grow and thrive and be those future leaders that we need them to be. Our Clinkin Haida people have stewarded our traditional ho homeland since the time immemorial. Clinkin Haida cultures are grounded in the values of respect for all living creatures and their environment and maintaining balance between the two. In Haida, we call that Yakudang. <clears throat> our way of life as Clinkin Haida people are guided by our traditional laws. For more than 10,000 years, our traditional and customary laws prescribe appropriate behavior between humans nature and wildlife and are based on respect and balance. And again, as I was alluding to, um, rather than viewing salmon as a resource to be managed, our worldview respects salmon as beings who permit humans to use their bodies for sustenance. Flowing from this acknowledgement of the self-sacrifice salmon must be treated with respect and should not be over har harvested or, and waste of any kind should be prohibited. We have our stories tell, and some probably know the story of the salmon boy. And he talks about a boy who disrespected salmon, so he was, be, um, became a salmon. And that lesson, and we believe those, I don't like to say stories because I believe they're our history, and I believe they're true, and I believe we had that balance 
with the animals, and that's why our people use those as moieties. That's why we claim them as our clans, because we had such deep connection. We spoke at a different level then, and I believe in our traditional languages, when they come back, we'll finally start hearing our animal relatives again. And I believe that. And some people might think that's crazy, but I don't. I believe that's who we are, it's who we come from. So, <clears throat> violations of the law to respect the salmon will result in reprisals, such as the salmon refu refusing to return the following year. And we're seeing that now. We're seeing ocean trawlers destroy our salmon. But greed and money keep this happening. And I think we need to call on our elected officials, quit taking their money. Quit taking their money. It's not worth it. Don't, don't run on a campaign that you're a salmon person and take money from those big trawlers. And I say that openly, and I say it to my friend. You can't take this money anymore. You can't truly represent us if you take that money. Because that money is about extraction. And, and not just extraction, it's wiping them out. You know, for, for one species, they're killing so many others. They're destroying habitat. They're destroying the ocean floors. We saw recently an orca killed by being taken by a pollock trawler. And I'm not glad that we lost that orca, that killer whale, but I am glad that it got attention. People need to know this is happening. While our local sustainable fisheries are attacked, these ocean trawlers owned by billion dollar corporations are absolutely devastating the ocean. And we have to take a voice on that. And our elected officials need to start acting on that. When entire regions of our state aren't getting a salmon return, it's in our constitution that we're the ones who are supposed to have first rights. Yet money controls all. Greed. And I don't even understand it. If I'm a fisherman, or if I own these billion dollar companies and I want them to continue to exist, I think I would care about the resource. That I would do my best to make sure that we were responsibly harvesting and not just devastating the ocean. Our, our salmon relatives are being wiped out. When I was a child in the village of Kassan, you could catch a 60-pound king all day long. It's probably been 20 years since I've even seen a 60-pound king. I remember they would have derbies back home, and the leaderboards would be 60, 70, 80-pound kings. Now they're 20. Isn't that, shouldn't that be like the canary in the mine? Shouldn't we be really concerned about the fact that these large salmon don't exist hardly at all anymore. You know, that we're seeing what happened with our lower 48 brothers and sisters in the dams. Well, for us, it's these ocean trawlers. And again, you see jobs and profit leave, but I wouldn't care if that, the jobs and profit stayed here, I'd still be against it, because it's not sustainable, it's not responsible, and it doesn't show respect to our, our environment, it doesn't show respect to our ancestors. It doesn't show respect to our animal spirit relatives. <clears throat> I think it's a uh, over harvesting is, is really key and in the problem. <clears throat> and I think it's time for us to recognize our place in this. <clears throat> we have to be valued in the process. The people cannot be removed from the equation in maintaining that balance. And I feel like our first people, our indigenous people here in Alaska, were all but removed from the equation. You know, we're fighting tooth and nail every day just to maintain what we had. And I can tell you, we're, we're losing ground on that. We're seeing it more and more every day. It breaks my heart. I have so many friends in the interior and in western Alaska where I remember going and having beautiful celebrations and eating fish, and now they, we're giving them fish. And we do so because they're our relatives and we love them. 
but I don't ever want to see the day where another region has to give me fish. And it breaks my heart to see that. And we're seeing transboundary mines. We're seeing so much outside influence controlling our, our way of life, influencing our way of life. And that's up to us. And we have to stand up. We have to demand our place in this equation. We're not an afterthought. We have sophisticated knowledge that goes back thousands and thousands of years. We know how to care for our resources. We know how to care for our lands. This isn't something that we have to go get a degree. It's in our DNA. And, and I find this interesting because I like to read. And Western science is starting to validate this. Did you know that? They're, they're showing that memories uh, are passed down in DNA. Well, we knew that all along. We've always known that. We've always known, we've, we've said it. We, we have this DNA, this memory, you know, it's our connection, it's the spirits, it's our ancestors come through in us. So we recognize the truth. We don't have to be told the truth, we know the truth. And Western science is finally coming around, catching up to us, you know, us who are barely out of savagery, Yet we had sophisticated science, math, doctors, and knowledge. We knew how to, and we still know how to care for our lands. We know it's wrong to overharvest. We know it's wrong to waste. And yet that's what we see Western industry doing every day. Over 12,000 pounds of king salmon went overboard today, dead. What would 12,000 pounds of king salmon look like to some of the communities in western Alaska or, or interior? What would that look for our communities? We have elders programs begging for food. We have food banks that can barely meet the needs. Yet industry is throwing away tens of thousands of pounds every day. Every day. Wanton waste. But you know, they could spend some money and change their gear and it would change everything overnight. And others have done that. Other, you know, you go up to European countries that have trawlers, they catch exactly what they want and they don't catch what they can't take care of. Why aren't we doing that? Because it's expensive. But if you, uh, if, again, if I was in the industry and I wanted it to exist, I'd put a little bit of that profit back into making sure that we had sustainable fisheries, that we weren't wantonly wasting our precious, precious king salmon. <clears throat> a new dynamic that we must navigate and find balance in is conservation efforts while being careful to not criminalize our ways of life. That is when we need to remember forward. We carry that traditional knowledge from our ancestors, what shows us how to live in balance and respect. And the Western world is finally catching on to what we've always known. Early explorers and anthropologists incorrectly described our ancestors and their ways of life as rudimentary, unsophisticated, uncivilized, and even worse. This mindset couldn't be further from the truth. Our people are and always have been highly sophisticated. Our people created governance systems, judicial systems, education systems, and commerce and trade. One of my passions is economic development. I call it economic sovereignty for our tribe. And I was speaking at Harvard, and I had a student come up to me and say, well, you talk about economic sovereignty, and you talk about economic development, that seems like a real Western mindset. And I said, oh no, don't get this twisted. My people created trade and commerce. We had very uh, sophisticated uh, relations between our clans over these resources. We trade and bartered, and don't romanticize us, we would kill over these trade routes. We would trade and, and enrich our clans, and we always lifted up others. But if they did it out of accordance, there would be war, you know? So I, I want people to understand 
when I talk about economic development, when I talk about economic sovereignty and commerce, that's something, again, that goes back for tens of thousands of years that we had very complex systems on. And those were very um, hard negotiated in our form of governance and law. So we had very strong systems. So unfortunately, the belief that our people are unsophisticated, unsophisticated and rudimentary still permeates throughout governmental agencies and the policies and laws that dictate how the US government, and especially the state of Alaska, can and will work with sovereign tribal governments. At a very young age, I was elected to leadership in my village. I was a mayor and then I became the tribal president. And I can tell you, I spent a lot of time up on the hill, a time where you couldn't even say tribe without whispering. So I'd wear my mayor hat to get tribal business done for my community. I'm thankful to see that that's lifting a bit. And I'm really, I really hope we'll continue to push the house to have the, the tribal affairs committee I think that has been astounding and super effective and opening doors and helping us educate. But I can tell you there's many up there who still think it's a waste of time, that tribes are insignificant. And I'm very proud that uh, Log and I, Liz Medicine Crow, Waf Algadok, Barbara Blake, and myself took it upon ourselves to push for a, a ballot measure for state recognition, which really pushed them into circumventing that and just signing it and getting it through. And, and I'm really proud of that. But what have we seen change since then? We, we need to see departments have all have tribal liaisons. There should be a tribal affairs office. They should be working with the tribes. We're the greatest resource in Alaska is our tribes. I really believe that. And you know you see it across. And yes, I represent Clinkett and Haida, and and we're we're the 800-pound gorilla. But I can tell you that's true in every village. I look, I'm looking out right now. I see Joel Jackson. He's a tribal president for the organized village of Cake. Cake is very sophisticated. Cake is very you know independent because of their leadership and because they know what they need and they can advocate for it. They can work and build for it. And they're not afraid to take folks on. I think we should all give them a round of applause for what they did on the, during the pandemic with the moose hunt. When, when the state told them they couldn't harvest the moose to meet their community's needs, they went ahead and did it, and they won in the court of law. And I, I just think that's how we demonstrate who we are, our sovereignty, and what we can do in our communities. And you might say it's a simple thing of moose. It's not. It's our way of life. And our tribes are, are one of the greatest resources in Alaska. And it's not a zero-sum game. It's not us versus them. But our participation should be valued. We should be asked, not told, or sometimes not even knowing what's happening because they don't think they have to work with us. <clears throat> so. As we convene for the rest of the week, I challenge you to acknowledge this and think of ways in which you and we can together create lasting impacts through changing outdated, inefficient, and ineffective policies and practice that in fact were created to disempower Alaska Native communities. We have an opportunity and a responsibility before us to work together for that positive change. Together, let us forge ahead with courage, conviction, and solidarity. Let us build the communities we want, protect our lands and waters, deepen our sovereignty, and heal the wounds of the past. For in doing so, we honor the legacy of our ancestors, uplift the voices of our descendants, and fulfill our sacred duty to the generations yet to come. And together, we remember forward.